Hi, please watch part 1 and part 2 of Ricket CA Simplified for continuity. So, in this part 3, we will discuss about clinical features of all Ricket CA in common. So, Ricket CA, as I told you, it's arthropod bond, right? So, bite or fe uh, feces from the infected arthropod that is lice or mite or ticks, any, any of these uh, uh, arthropods. So, what happens? This from uh, this is the source of infection when it enters the blood uh, bloodstream due to bite or sc uh, scratching of the scalp or any other reason that time the organism multiplies locally it multiplies locally after invading and later it enters the bloodstream after entering the bloodstream bloodstream at the site of entry it uh, particularly prefers the vascular endothelial cells so, on reaching the vascular endothelial cells, these organisms enter the vascular endothelial cells and they multiply, they enlarge and they degenerate these cells and they cause thrombosis of the vessels and later leading to rupture. I am so sorry. Thrombosis of the vessels and later leading to rupture and necrosis in the area. So, this is common features for general for all rickets CA. So, uh, the, generally it is most commonly seen in travelers. Most commonly seen in travelers and the uh, clinical features occur 1 to 2 weeks or the clinical features manifest 1 to 2 weeks after their travel. So, during the travel what happens they get infected. So, they reach their place most probably within one or two weeks and clinical symptoms start appearing after they reach the place. So, it looks like they got infected after coming back to their own place. So, this is where we need to be careful. So, so clinical features type wise epidemic typhus. Epidemic typhus is the severe form of the disease, okay. So, you will have severe headache, chills, myalgia, high fever like we already discussed like viral prodrome and after one week there, it can even be as severe enough to cause clouding of consciousness. And there is typical occurrence of macular papilla rash on 4th to 7th day of illness. So, these are the clinical features of epidemic illness, epidemic typhus. Same thing for Brilzinger disease applies only that the clinical features are milder. Now when we take off endemic typhus, endemic typhus I told you it is mainly between the rat and the flea. It's the story of the rat and the flea. So man is actually an accidental host. So if man is an accidental host, this infection in the human beings become dead, becomes a dead end infection. So, man-to-man -man transmission through lice or anything is not possible. Again, like we already discussed, similar symptoms of the epidemic typhus only except that it, the symptoms are in the milder form. Now, we go to the second variety that is the spotted fever. Spotted fever has three types, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, rickets cell pox and others. So, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is the most serious. All the symptoms like fever, headache, myalgia, chills, cloud, uh, clouding with consciousness, maculopapular rash are all similar to that of your epidemic typhus <coughs> except that is a, it is the most serious form and we all know that spotted group except rickettsial pox is due to tick right. So, wherever there is tick involved at the site of the bite of the tick there is typical characteristic Eshkar formation. Eshkar is locally necrotic tissue. So, at the bite of the site of the tick, there is Eshkar formation. And rickettsial pox, since its similarity with the chicken pox, it forms rash which are vesicle in nature. Okay. So, that is one thing we need to remember. One and last point, all other types except this Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever which is very serious and rickettsial pox which forms vesicular rash. All other forms in spotted fever are the milder forms of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So, we made clinical features here easy. Now, we go to the third variety that is Orientia. Orientia is very simple, it is 1 plus 2. It's the third variety, same Rocky Mountain spotted fever features or you can take it as epidemic typhus features plus Eshkar. So, whichever is there in first group and second group. So, epidemic typhus fevers plus Eshkar is your Orientia. Okay, and or else you can remember it as all clinical symptoms and because it is tick-borne, 
so wherever there is bite there is eschar formation okay last group is coxiella coxiella is very different you need to pay attention here coxiella remember cow okay so cox cow so it is basically involved with dealing with milk animals dust and soil so all you have to remember it's infective through milk dust and soil and because dust portion is because of dust portion involved i think <coughs> you remember that this is spread through aerosol okay in now let's make coxella bunniti more interesting coxella bunniti we know that it causes q fever right it was called as q fever because the etiology etiological agent was not known so what was the necessity to take such hurry and name it as q fever you people keep finding out the etiological agent till then we'll call it q fever and keep diagnosing and helping and treating people with whatever antibiotics we have there is a reason it used to cause severe illnesses like pneumonia endocarditis hepatitis and meningoencephalitis so just remember it attacks all the vital organs okay it attacks all the vital organs but one classical point is there is no rash so there is no rash so we were sure that it wasn't in the rickettsial group at least there is no rash please remember there is no rash so one more things you need to know about the um, coxella bunniti is not just it causes q fever there are subtypes in q fever as well there is acute q fever post q fever fatigue syndrome and chronic q fever with endocarditis in acute q fever you get all the symptoms i mentioned similar to that of your typhus fever along with hepatitis pneumonia cns involvement pericarditis all the dangerous symptoms that's it all organs are affected next post q fever fatigue syndrome is simple the name is explanatory chronic q fever why you need to know is because of endocarditis this endocarditis you have to remember because it's a differential diagnosis for culture negative endocarditis so these are the only thing important things you remember to know you need to remember next we'll discuss differential diagnosis based on rash and how to remember these rashes <clears throat> so epidemic typhus so let's i'll draw a few funny diagrams to make it interesting epidemic typhus is louse bone louse starts in the head right so this person is very upset okay so this is louse bone so this clouding consciousness also you can remember so the rash is spread all over so it is spread all over except palms and soles easy epidemic is very bad suddenly you get severe form of illness so it it spreads everywhere except palms and soles endemic endemic is persistent throughout all okay so endemic rash can occur anywhere and everywhere endemic is everywhere epidemic is rash epidemic is rash except in palms and soles for those who want more complicated stuff endemic first starts in the trunk and follows to extremities okay next rocky mountain spotted fever and indian tick typhus this is really interesting rocky mountain spotted fever and indian tick typhus have something in common that is mountain i'll tell you why indians are very fond of this specific drawing that is this two mountains and a sun yes all of us have done this during school so rocky mountain spotted fever and indian tick typhus remember mountains for mountains when you go for trekking what you do generally walk over all possible plants touch these plants touch this flower take a selfie so rash is characteristically seen in rocky mountain spotted fever and indian tick typhus in palms and soles and that's also the reason why okay this is just a story that's also the reason why first you get rash in palms and soles later you get fever in the clinical features okay i told in a video i think first video that i'll be explaining the reason for this so remember like this no rash is characteristic q fever right no rash is characteristic for q fever 
Next, vesicular rash, again we have already discussed, that is rickettsial pox. Again, for those who want extra info, you can also add half frequent tick typhus. So, differential diagnosis by rash. Next, um, laboratory diagnosis, we know the world famous wheel felix reaction. Wheel felix reaction, firstly, you need to know the three antigenic components we used, that is OX19. OX2 and OXK. Now, this OX19 and OX2 are common. Why did I say the word common? Common means vulgaris. No clue? Okay. Proteus vulgaris. These two are derived or these two are the Remember the three antigens we had discussed and the third antigen was the alkali stable polysaccharide antigen. That antigen is common with the proteus species. This proteus species, there are two. So epidemic typhus gives positive result with both OX19 and OX2. And, and the third antigen which we use for wheel felix reaction is OXK and this I'll write it in a different And this is derived from Proteus mirabilis. So OX19 and OXK are from Proteus vulgaris and OXK, sorry. So OX19 and OX2 are from Proteus vulgaris. OXK is from mirabilis. So, epidemic typhus give positive result with both. Brill's Sensor disease is again a form, a latent form of epidemic typhus, right? So, it gives weakly positive with 19, it is negative with 2. This is obviously negative again. Next, endemic again gives positive results with OX19 and OX2. Next, Orientia, it is very simple. The only thing you need to remember is Orientia. O and K. Orientia OK. Orientia is positive with only OK. OXK. That's it. The only test which Orientia is positive is OXK. The o only species for which OXK becomes positive is Orientia. Okay. And others remain negative for everything else. So epidemic, endemic, positive for 19 and 2. Brilzenzers, weekly positive for 19. And OXK positive only for Orientia. So now you realize that epidemic and endemic or this wheel felix reaction cannot differentiate epidemic and endemic, right? So for this we have a separate test and this is Neil Moser reaction. This is also called as Tunica reaction. Please remember this funny pig. Yes, this is a pig. I had to tell this. So what they do is they took blood from the patient or from the pa case of epidemic or endemic typhus and this was injected intraperitoneally in a guinea pig and what was observed is characteristic scrotal inflammation. Characteristic scrotal inflammation enlarged testis and it was so much that it developed adhesions and it can it could not be put back into the abdomen. So this is known as neil muser reaction but since it involves testicular inflammation it is also called as tunica reaction okay so pigs are everywhere if pigs are everywhere so everywhere goes with endemicity so endemicity means this reaction is positive for endemic typhus or you can also remember muser is positive for Museri. Very simple, negative for epidemic or Provazaki. However, the recent tests which you need to know are complement fixation test and latest ag latex agglutination test and also enzyme immunoassay all done with particulate or extracted antigens for which you use the patient serum to detect antibodies and their levels and you check for a rising titer. Now we saw in Wheels Felix test that we are using the antigens of the 
proteus uh, proteus organisms right so there is a disadvantage in this that there is false positive reaction can occur when there are infections from the proteus itself and also salmonella typhi